good day. Today I'm going to be reviewing the Cypheus Kane Omnibus. The Omnibus collects the first three novels in the Cypheus Kane series. That would be For the Emperor, Caves of Ice, and The Traitor's Hand. Now, the Cypheus Kane series is, in the in-universe explanation, part of the Kane archive. It's basically where Cypheus Kane, the main character of the series, went and wrote about his exploits during his career as a commissar. Now the thing is, it sort of ruins any sort of suspense because you know he has to survive in order to retire and then write his memoirs. But it creates what I like to call reverse suspense. You don't know exactly what's going to happen, but you know something big is about to go down. Like when he writes, had I known this was going to happen, I would have been slowly gibbering underneath the table. You know something big is about to go down when he writes about that. Now, Cypheus is what I like to call a flawed hero. He's the sort of hero that if you needed someone to save the world, and it could only be that particular person, he would say, all right, I need 500 million up front with another billion at the completion of the contract. Meaning, he is not self-righteous like Superman, and he's not dark and brooding like Batman. He's just a normal guy trying to make his way in the universe. Although, he chose a pretty bad career being a commissar. You see, in the Warhammer 40,000 universe, when you go into the military, you're in there for life, which is usually rather short. But, he's able to sort of turn it to his advantage. And he's, all, he's one of those types of people that is very intelligent. He's able to manipulate people. He's, he's basically like Frazier, except he kills people. Well. He kills people, aliens, alien robots, demons, and various assorted people that are generally hostile to known forms of life. In any event, Cypheus is a very entertaining character, which we'll see in a moment. He also has an aide known as Ferric Jurgen. Jurgen being a play on words. Jurgen Soap. Jurgen is actually the antithesis of Soap. He is probably the most nasty person I've ever read about. He's supposed to never shower, never shave, and just be completely encrusted with grime. That's basically what Cain said. He's just perpetually encrusted with this fine layer of grit all on his body. He's also supposed to have a foul odor constantly following him. Or as Cyphus would say, his peculiar bouquet. And then of course there's Amberly Vale. She's an inquisitor. Essentially, she's a member of the Imperium secret police, except they're not that secret. They act like a secret police, except people know about them. They're the feared police, I suppose, would be the best thing. Because usually you know about the secret police, you're just afraid of them. So it's the feared police. And she comes in the books from time to time, taking Kane on various adventures that would almost get anyone else but him killed. The one thing I do like about this novel series is that there is no red shirting. People die because they're in a dangerous environment. But it's not just a random idiot here and there. It happens on a fairly small scale basis. So you don't just have random idiot AA23 killed in order to show you that Kane's in danger. You already know he's in danger, so the author chose not to make it even more obvious. Also, a bit of background on the commissariat. The commissariat is a essentially a political officer. Okay, essentially they're supposed to ensure the loyalty of the regiment. They're supposed to ensure that everyone is giving 110 percent for the Emperor. So before we get into the book proper, let me explain how this is going to go. I will give a brief overview of the overplot, what the novel actually accomplished. And then I'm going to point out some of the various important plot points in the novel. I can't go through everything because it would take too long. But the one thing I am going to make special care to point out is the boss battles that take place in the Kane novels. I mean, at first glance, you might think that boss battles are purely a video game phenomenon, but they're really not. All a boss battle really is, is a fight between a single higher-powered character and a lower-powered character. And Kane gets into these on a regular basis. Throughout the first three novels, he fights against a hive tyrant, at least two Chaos Space Marines, and a demon. And usually when he fights against these things, it's 
with his blast pistol and chainsaw. I mean, imagine going up against a hyper-advanced Master Chief with nothing more than a chainsaw-like sword. Okay, the book itself is just weird. I mean, it's bound in some kind of weird plastic material. I've never had a plastic-bound book before. I mean, paper-bound books are bound in paper. Hard-bound books are bound in some kind of cardboard-like substance, but this is plastic, and I suppose the plastic binding is supposed to make it seem like it's more martial, that it could survive time in the field, but I really couldn't say. But I do like it. I think it makes it go above and beyond. I mean, you don't see too many books that are bound in a really different way. Everything's bound pretty much the same, so it makes it kind of unique. And I'd say that was some pretty good work on that. Also, I've read in several places that this is supposed to be a propaganda photo of Cypheus Kane, and I have to agree because look at this uniform here. I mean, seriously. The gold epaulets, the red flanges here, the red gloves, and this giant gold thing on his hat. I mean, his head would be taken off in like a second. Also, in the novel, he carries a las pistol and not a bolt pistol. Also, the chainsword is much too big because he's talking about sword fighting with the thing, and you couldn't sword fight with something this bulky and ungainly. And also, look at Kane himself. He's way too bulky. In the novel, he's depicted as being fairly normal-sized. Now, of course, he's about two meters tall, but he's depicted not as being overly muscled. Now, I think two meters equates to about, like, six feet, I think. And also, look at the orc. He looks so sad, even though he's quite obviously just a skull. I've never seen a sad skull before. But I suppose that is one right there. Overall, I have to say the cover's pretty nice. I mean, you wouldn't mind having this sit out where you could see it, you know? So in any event, let's crack open this book. And take a look at Cypheus Kane, Hero of the Imperium. At the beginning of every Warhammer 40,000 novel, we get this little spiel here. It's supposed to try and explain the Warhammer 40,000 universe, and also it's supposed to get you in the right mood as well. So let's take a look at it. It is the 41st millennium. For more than a hundred centuries, the Emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of Earth. He is the master of mankind by the will of the gods and master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He is a rotting carcass writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carrion lord of the Imperium, for whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day so that he may never truly die. Yet even in his deathless state, the Emperor continues his eternal vigilance. Mighty battle feats cross the demon-infested miasma of the warp, the only route between distant stars. Their way lit by the astronomician, the psychic manifestation of the Emperor's will. Vast armies give battle in his name on uncounted worlds. Greatest amongst his soldiers are the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines, bioengineered super warriors. Their comrades in arms are Legion, the Imperial Guard, and countless planetary defense forces. The ever vigilant Inquisition and the tech priests of the Adeptus Mechanicus are to only name a few. But for all their multitudes, they are barely enough to hold off the ever present threat from aliens, heretics, mutants, and worse. To be a man or woman in such times is to be one amongst untold aliens. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloody regime imaginable. These are the tales of those times. Forget the power of science and technology for so much has been forgotten, never to be relearned. Forget the promise of progress and understanding. For in the grim, dark future there is only war. There is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage and slaughter, and the laughter of thirsting gods.